Hey Valley Brook, we miss you. Welcome and hi from Owen Park. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm Jacob. Welcome to Valley Brook. <laughs> we miss you. Hi, my, my name, name is Nate. Nate. Welcome to Valley Brook. <laughs> Good morning everyone. Welcome to Valley Brook. Welcome online. We're so grateful that you tuned in. There's a lot of crazy stuff going through the news again this week and one thing that we can be sure of is we can stand in God's love because fear doesn't stand a chance when we stand in his love. So that's what we're going to sing this morning. Born of his spirit, 
washed in his blood this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day is my song praising my Savior all the day long perfect submission perfect delight visions of wrath submission all at its rest I in my Savior am happy and blessed watching and waiting looking above Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day. of death entangled me the anguish of the grave came over me I was overcome by distress and sorrow then I called on the name of the Lord Lord save me the Lord is gracious and righteous our God is full of compassion the Lord protects the unwary when I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. And all my days 
I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am the goodness of God. Oh, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your sing of the goodness of God oh, yes I will sing of the goodness of God Father God we thank you we thank you for the goodness that you show us this morning that you showed us yesterday and that you will show us again tomorrow and every day after. For you are faithful. You are faithful yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I'm going to keep running after you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church, and welcome to our online service. If this is your first time or your 50th time joining us here at Valleybrook, I want you to go to valleybrookchurch.org forward slash connect and fill out our connection form. There's places there where we can hear about your life, ways that we can pray for you, or ways that you can get plugged in here at this community. And there's also the opportunity for you to join in on our Tuesday prayer group. So if you are interested in the evening Tuesday prayer group, email Travis and he'll send you the Zoom link. Another way for you to get connected here at Valley Brick is to join our summer small group. This is going to be a smaller small group going through a study called Oneness Embraced. And Pastor Nate is going to be leading this and it's all about racial reconciliation in the church. So if you're interested in that, contact Nate because it starts really soon. 
Next, I want to invite all families of any Imitate program throughout the church to join us on Saturday, July 25th at Rod and Gun Park from 10 a.m. to 1 a.m. for a family hangout and a sixth grade prayer commission. This is going to be a time to pray for our upcoming sixth graders and cast vision for our younger students as they go into their new seasons of life. And finally, if you feel led to give to the mission and vision of Valley Brook Church, you can go to valleybrookchurch.org forward slash give. Your financial donations are invaluable to us. They help us to do things like help people who are in need and also partake in services both at Owen Park and online. So if you feel led to give, we'd appreciate any amount. Thanks, Jeff, and the worship team for leading us in worship this morning. And thank you, Evan, for those very important announcements, keeping everyone connected here at Valley Brook uh, while we're off and about. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Valley Brook's online service. My name is Travis. If we haven't had the chance to meet, thank you for joining us today. So a study done by Yale tested 200 people to identify the smell or the scent of 80 common things, whether they could identify what they are. The most recognized was, number one, can you guess what it is? Can you guess what number one is? Coffee. Yep. And number two, peanut butter. And you're like going, ah, yeah, of course I totally get it. Number three was Vicks Vapor Rub. <laughs> Who can remember that, right? Uh, chocolate and wintergreen oil. The others included uh, oranges, cinnamon, dry cat food even made the top 20 list, and tuna. And wouldn't you believe it, rounding out the top 20... Crayons. Yep, crayons. Who could forget the smell of that distinct, waxy smell of a stick of creativity just waiting to explode onto the pages of a blank sheet of paper, right? For more than 100 years, crayons have been the go-to in helping kids bring about their imagination onto paper or walls or whatever it happens to be. In fact, I learned that... Uh, they make uh, 3 billion crayons a year, which is equal of, of circling the planet six times if you put them end to end. Unbelievable, right? As children, uh, I remember, and maybe you did too, we, we were just, we longed for the, and, and we were quite envious of the, the 64 pack of the crayons, right? Oh, of course. And it had to have the sharpener on the back because that was so important after you kind of you know, rubbed it down, nubbed. And so sharpening them up. But, but um, so many colors to choose from. Oh, yes, very distinct smell, right? So many colors to choose from. So many things to draw. Well, let me ask you, what, what is your favorite color? Or what was your favorite crayon color of growing up? Can you name it? Do you remember the name of the, car, the crayon, the color that you liked while growing up? For me, it was uh, Midnight Blue uh, and uh, Goldenrod and, um, and the other one, not super imaginative on the name, but Red Orange. Can you imagine what that color looked like? Red Orange? Yep, of course. I love, love, love those colors so much. Well, the original crayon sold in 1903 where it came in a box of eight. There was only eight in the original box, um, eight colors. And believe it or not, there are now 120 Crayon colors. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, but what if we were only limited to one or two crayons, one or two colors, that is, when we wanted to draw the beautiful picture of a rainbow or a sunset or a field full of flowers? What if we only had one or two colors? What would that look like? Well, it would look quite monotone, right? And, 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 and honestly, with only one or two colors and trying to display the beauty of a rainbow or a sunset, it just would be incomplete without all the other colors. It's, it's, it's having the entire box of crayons, the whole ra the, the range of colors, and with all of its diversity and its variety, that truly brings out the dignity and the value and the beauty of a project to help capture all that it really is, the sunset, the rainbow, the field of flowers, or whatever you're drawing. Well, God must love variety. I heard someone say, even plants of the same species are different. Some are tall, some are leafy, some are just a profusion of flowers all over. And he is not a God of an assembly line creation, but one who loves and appreciates the differences. 
And if he would do that in creation, he very much would do that with us too. So today in our series, On the Move, we're picking up in Acts 10 and 11, where the church transitions and pivots and moves, as you will, as God calls her to be multiracial, multi-ethnic, and multicultural. This is one of those moments in history, folks. This is one of this. Listen to me here. This is one of those moments in history that's so huge. It's so dramatic. There's such a huge seismic shift that occurs right here in history. Unlike anything that had ever been seen in 1,400 years. The type of change that when it happens, there's no going back. The box has been open and this becomes the new normal. And for any of you, or myself included, who... Uh, doesn't come from a Jewish heritage or background, can really learn to appreciate what happens in Acts chapter 10. Because if it didn't happen, we wouldn't have the hope. We wouldn't be here talking about Jesus and we certainly wouldn't be welcomed into the church. It'd be quite segregated. And so if you'd, le- if you'd like to follow along today with your Bibles, I encourage you, open up to Acts chapter 10 And there's something different that we're going to do today. There are not going to be any slides on the screen, so it's really important for you to uh, either follow along or just listen up. And so I'm going to try my best to read here, and you can just listen in. But we're going to be in Acts chapter 10, verse 1 right now. And uh, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all of his household, He gave alms generously to the people and prayed continuously to God. In about the ninth hour, or 3 p.m. in the afternoon, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. So you've got Simon and Simon down in Joppa and you need to send some guys there. So Cornelius, he's a Roman centurion. That means that he's a commanding officer of the Roman army and he's overseeing a hundred soldiers. And he's a God-fearing man, which means he's, he's given up worshiping other gods. He saw the emptiness of it, and now he prays to God, the God of the Bible. He prays to God and generously gives to people. And God hears his prayer, giving him the hope that anyone who seeks God, just like that verse we shared last week, anyone who seeks God, God will be found by him. He will show himself to them. And so here Cornelius is, is praying, and God gives him a vision. He says, send Send some people to go find Simon and Simon down in Joppa. So he calls two of his servants and a soldier and sends them on a mission to find Peter and Joppa. All right, picking up in verse 9. And the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the house, uh, housetop about the sixth hour or about noon to pray. He had become hungry, or hangry, maybe hangry, but it says hungry. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by the four corners on the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter. Kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now let's unpack this a little bit. The Old Testament commanded the people of Israel to not eat animals considered unclean. You'd have to go all the way back to Leviticus and specifically Leviticus chapter 11 where it outlines that some animals were okay to eat. They were considered clean like uh, sheep, goats, cows, uh, fish that had scales, not not skin but scales, um, and certain birds could be eaten. 
And then there were the animals that you could not eat if you were from Israel. They were, they were prohibited and they were considered unclean. Some of them included like camels, uh, shellfish, seagulls, eagles, vultures. Who'd want to eat a vulture anyway? But God commanded, don't do it. Owls, pigs, and so on. And the list keeps going on. Now you might be wondering... Why, why would God say some animals are okay to eat and others are not okay to eat? And yet, later on, then when he comes to Peter, that now it's okay to eat them all. Don't consider them unclean. You might be wondering, why is that? We'll, we'll get back to that in a little bit. Uh, but God made this distinction between animals, uh, not because God had something against bacon and lobster for the people of Israel, uh-uh. But, but it was to help keep his people separated from the neighbors, those who were worshiping other gods. And he didn't want them to be tempted or to be associating with those folks. He wanted to keep them set apart from those cultures, those ethnics, those nations, those people, to keep them separate. And by distinguishing the food, it helped to set them apart as a different type of people. So by not eating the food or associating with people who ate that food, it distinguished them and set them apart. And, and, and in doing so, it also helped to enforce social distancing. See, it's in the Bible. Social distancing between Israel and everybody else by just not eating that kind of food or hanging around with people that did it. So for 1,400 years, Jewish people didn't hang out with, they didn't associate with, they did not eat food with, or, be, or f even eat food that was prepared by Gentiles. What that meant is Jewish couples, when they're going out on a date, would not go to a gentle, Gentile restaurant on a date. Jewish boys did not marry Jewish girls. Uh, Jewish kids did not play with Gentile, Gentile kids. Imagine growing up, being taught generation after generation for 1,400 years to stay away from Gentiles. Being taught that they are unclean, and they are defiled. Imagine that. Now, that's some baggage that you bring into this, right? If that's, that's what you've been raised up as generation after generation, that's some baggage. And that's exactly what Peter in the early church is dealing with right here. That's what's going on. So God shows Peter that uh, with pigs in the blanket coming down from heaven right alongside with sheep, they're both in there, pigs in the blanket and sheep in the blanket, and they're coming down the unclean with the clean, and that there's room enough for everyone in Jesus' new covenant, in his new kingdom. They all belong together, the unclean and the clean. And this is profound, folks. This is profound. Jews and Gentiles can be together in Jesus' new kingdom. This is it. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. God's heart values every person. God's heart values every person. He no longer says that there's unclean and clean. There should be no distinction anymore. But every person made in the image of God is valued by God. And it, 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 it's clear right here in this passage. And since God's church, the, his church is his plan A, his only plan A, there is no plan B, his plan A for reaching the world, the church's heart also must beat after the same thing. Must follow after the same thing. To value every person. That's what's going on here. Now Peter wakes from his vision and he's thinking, I wonder what bacon tastes like. No, I'm just kidding. He, he wasn't thinking that. Instead, he's wondering, what does this vision mean that God just gave to him on this roof? Unclean and clean animals. And the angel says, don't call common what I've called common. Don't, don't call it unclean. And just then there's a rap tap tap on the door and the three people that Cornelius sent are there. And so Peter goes down and he invites them in and plays host to them. Now something's happening here. Something's happening. God is already at work because no self-respecting Jew welcomed a Gentile much less a soldier of the enemy army to come into this space, into this place, and to feed them and to interact with them, to talk with them, to host them in their place. 
something, something seismic is happening right here. And so they do that uh, that night. They stay overnight. And then the next day, they go back to Caesarea to find Cornelius, where Peter and Cornelius compare their visions and it lines up. And then it says, Cornelius gathers together all of his relatives and all of his friends together. He invited them all. Everyone he loves and everyone who is dear to him, he invites to come and hear what God is doing and about to do. They're going to get a front row seat to this amazing moment in history. Now, I'm going to ask, would, would you invite others to come and listen to if you knew that this was going to be happening? If you could sense that God is working, would you invite some of your closest relatives and some of your best friends to come and hear what God is doing? That's what Cornelius does. He gathers them all together. And then picking up in verse 33, it says, So I sent for you at once, in comparing a story, and you have, Peter, you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we all, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded to by the Lord. By the way, if you're following along in your Bible, you're going to see the word all repeated a lot. But Cornelius gets here. We are all here to hear all that you have commanded um, from the Lord. So Peter opens his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every or all nations, everyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. God's heart for the nations comes through right there. God's heart for the nations. And as for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, that he is Lord of, say it with me, all. He's Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all of Judea. That even the Gentiles knew what was going on. From beginning, from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God appointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we were all, we were, we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. But they put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on uh, the third day and made him to appear, not to all of the people, but to us who have been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Let's pause there. They, they believe, as Peter's sharing the good news, the gospel, the good news that Jesus is the victor in this battle against sin and against death and against the enemy of the devil, that he is the victor. And, and as Peter's sharing this news with them, they believe the news about Jesus, and they say yes to him. And the Holy Spirit falls on all who are there who heard the word, including the Gentiles, including the nations. And they begin speaking in tongues or languages that are not their own. This is identical to what happens back at the very beginning of Acts in, in, uh, at Pentecost, some 10 years earlier in the church, when the Holy Spirit fell upon the Israelites who were believing in Jesus to be the Messiah, allowing them to speak miraculously the languages of all the people who were there and people could understand them, all, of all these multiple ethnic groups, they could hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that was given to the Israelite believers at the time, the 120 people. And now God is giving the very same promised Holy Spirit to the Gentiles to show them that God is big enough to share that they are included in the same promise that the Israelites were promised. Jesus is big enough for all of them. There's enough room in heaven for everybody. Those who say yes to Jesus. So then uh, Peter spends several more days with them. Oh, but, hey, but before I get there, they, they all get baptized. They get baptized to mark them as believers and followers in Jesus Christ. They all are baptized. And then Peter, uh, they compel Peter to spend a few more days with them, and he does. In Acts 11, 
word gets around. Word gets around that um, uh, that uh, that the church is now welcoming Gentiles. You know, word on the street is uh, the church is welcoming Gentiles, and so they criticize Peter, which which some of the most difficult people, some of the most criticizing people come from within the church, believe it or not, they do. And so they criticize Peter. How, undare, how dare you that you would go hang out with uncircumcised men and you would eat with them? Peter, you remember your upbringing? You remember our heritage? Are you kidding me? Why are you doing this? Well, I think it's because we fear the things we don't know. And so that, that this is the baggage that they're bringing to it. And so Peter tells them what happens uh, everything that happens right here. And he wraps it up. He tells them in, in verse 15, he says, as I began to speak, sharing the gospel to them, that is, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as it, uh, just as it did on us in the beginning. And as I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in God's way? <laughs> who am I to stand in God's way? I love that, what Peter gets at. Have, have you ever tried to stand in God's way? Yeah, how did that work out? Probably not well, right? Well, get this. When they heard these things, the church that was gathered there, when they heard these things, this testimony of Peter, they fell silent. And then they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Yeah, when Peter's telling this story, first they criticize, Peter tells the story, the full testimony, then they criticize, and then there's this hush. This, this, everyone fell silent. You could hear a pin drop in the room. And then, just like that, it's like a bunch of light bulbs went on. Ah, God's welcoming the Gentiles into the church too. And then they just start yipping and they, yay God, he's, he, the gospel is for them too. You know, we, we might have treated him one way, but God is big enough to hold them and take care of them and, and share Jesus with them. And so everything changed. They start worshiping God and everything changed. Now, this should not have been a surprise uh, to the Israelites because it's sprinkled throughout the pages of the Bible. They're, they're filled with God's plan to restore and to renew the things that our sinful nature had broke, including race, re race, re relations, race, <laughs> race relations with other people. The, including that, that God would redeem that. He'd bring that back. So you go all the way back to Genesis 1. God creates the first humans implanting his image on them. You know what that means? That every human being is made in the image of God. No matter their color or their shape, we're all made in the image of God. He didn't make some with a lesser image of God and some more with a greater image of God. We're all made with the image of God and we're equal in his sight. But we don't even get to Genesis 3 in, in, in the beginning. We don't even get to Genesis 3 when, when our first parents, they, for, they sin. They sin against God, creating this rift between one another, uh, be, between God and them and against one another. And then we don't even get uh, into Genesis 4 and Cain is jealous of his brother Abel and he kills him. He kills him. Genesis 6 through 10, we see the world becomes more and more wicked and it's just filling up with greater isolation, greater separation between people. And, and so God sends a flood as a judgment. But he saves eight people, and, uh, which means, folks, we're all related. Yep, <laughs> that's maybe why it's hard to get, to get along sometimes. Family doesn't get along really well. But we're all related all the way back to the people that are in the ark. And when they get off the ark, they multiply and they multiply and they multiply. And we find in Genesis 11 that there's one culture, one language, and they have one goal. Yep, that's it. They're to build a tower, the Tower of Babel, to reach the heavens, to try to get equal with God. And wouldn't you know that it's their pride, their very pride that's bringing them together and saying, let's work together, let's get equal to God in the standing that God would use the same pride to keep them apart because God separates them with his different languages 
with different languages, different ethnics, different cultures, and it would be their own cultures and their own ethnics and their, uh, and their own languages, their own shared experiences, that their pride in that would keep them apart. It would keep other people at bay from getting to know them uh, and keeping them separated. But right there in Genesis 12, you just turn right one page over from Genesis 11 to 12. Genesis 12, God makes a promise by making Abraham and calling him uh, and sharing with him that he, through him all nations would someday be blessed. But it'd be centered on God. It'd be centered on God. Now, although the, the people of Israel would be sent, you can keep going through the pages of the Bible, the people of Israel would be set apart. They'd be God's chosen people. And they would take that pretty seriously, that they were really, really special. But you can find that there's always hints that they were blessed and they were a light so they could be a light to the nations and they could be a blessing to bless others. Jesus himself affirms, uh, affirms this by saying, for God so loved the world, the world, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. That's right. And then Jesus, even then, before he ascends back to heaven, he gives the great commission to the church. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That word there, nations, ethnos. We get ethnic from that. All of our ethnicities Go and make disciples of all ethnicities, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded. Jesus himself says that. Go into all the places. And then we get this glimpse of the, early, of the future church in Revelation 7, all the way to the end. Revelation 7, when all tribes, tongues, and nations are gathered around the throne, worshiping God. A representation of, of all tribes, tongues, and nations. All the ethnos are there. So what that all means is whatever your tribe, whatever your tongue, whatever your people, whatever your nation, whatever your status, whatever your color, whatever your social economic status, whatever your background, you are welcomed by God. You're welcomed by God into the church. Absolutely. That's, that's the barrier that breaks down right here in Acts 10 and 11. But how do we get there? That's my question for you. How do we get there? When God's heart celebrates racial diversity, when birds of the feather, birds of the feather tend to flock together, right? It, it's nothing new. We, we naturally gravitate towards people who look like us, who speak like us, who act like us, who think like us, that even vote like us. Because frankly, we flock together because it's way easier to be around people who get us. And we get them. And they get us. And it's just a lot easier that way. But just because it's easy doesn't mean it's best. And it certainly doesn't mean it's part of God's plan. Jerome, uh, Jerome Gay says this, The gospel is not colorblind, but color engaging. The gospel is not colorblind, but color engaging. Racial in, uh, integration doesn't passively happen. Even Jesus' great commission doesn't say, stay and make disciples with people just like you. It says, go and make disciples of all nations. It's an active engagement to get out there. So, racial integration in the church takes engagement active engagement. It takes hard work. It takes time. It takes energy. It takes resources. And many times, you're not going to feel comfortable in this. You think Peter felt comfortable going to Cornelius' house? Absolutely not. But you're, you're not going to feel comfortable as you engage in the most important thing in the church, as we see in Acts 10 and 11 right here. And, and that's good that it's not easy because it's going to cause us to rely on God. It's going to cause us to rely on God. Our, our, our passive nature is to just run away from it, but this is going to cause us to rely on God. No one likes change. We all like the easy road. But the closer we get to God's heart, the more we become like Jesus, 
the more he's going to push us in seeking what he wants and what he set out to do to bring all the nations to himself. That includes, though, the more we become like Jesus, the more he's going to make us love him more and love others more. The two great commandments, love God more, love others more. And that includes people that are different than us. I, I, I use this illustration um, well, a lot of times in counseling married couples. It's the triangle. You've got three points of the triangle. You've got the top and you've got the two bottoms and if you've got the husband and wife. But this works the same right here for each one of us. If, if you're here and I'm here or if they're here and, and we're here, the closer we get to God, the closer we get to one another. The closer we get to God, the closer we get to one another and there's no avoiding it. You know, we could, we could pretend like it, but the closer we get to God, the, the more we are like his heart in seeing the nations come to know Jesus, the closer we come to one another. And yeah, it's uncomfortable there because they don't look like us. They don't smell like us. They don't, they don't speak like us. They don't get us. And we don't get them. But we've got to work at it to make it work. We've got to allow for Jesus to work in us. In fact, let me say this, that we must first experience this life-changing love of God in us. God's got to work in us. God's got to work in us first before we can be led into the mission of God in reaching the nations and being a church that would example what heaven would look like. We don't have to wait for heaven to see the beauty of God's display in, in the diversity of race and tongues and nations. We don't have to wait for heaven to see that. It's going to be there. Why not have it here on earth? Why not have it right here? I believe that God is calling us as a church to lead in the conversation because it's at God's heart. It's at God's heart to value every person because we've all been made in the image of God. And the key is taking the gospel to them. And this is how we're going to engage. We're going to listen, we're going to learn, we're going to pray, and we're going to act. We're not going to be passive. We're going to be active. And so I'm going to leave you with this. What do you sense God is directing you to do? Well, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. What do you sense God is directing you to do? No, no, I'm sorry, I still got that wrong. What do you sense God is directing to do in you and through you regarding valuing every person? What do you think God is doing in you and wants to do through you in valuing every person? every person. Now, if you know what that is, if you know what God is doing in you and wanting to do through you, then trust God and pray for him to give you courage to walk in it. That you wouldn't just be a hearer of the word, but you'd be a doer of the word. You'd walk in what God's wanting you to walk in, in being active. And if you don't know or you don't perceive what God is doing in you regarding valuing every person, or wants to do through you in valuing every person, then pray with me and ask God to help show that. So let's pray. Father, we, um, we thank you for sharing your heart with us because first and foremost, we would not be here if it was not for you loving us. You came after us. You welcomed us into your family with all of our differences. We thank you for bringing us to unity at the blood of Jesus Christ at his cross and that you, you, you want to see the church to be a community of diversity centered around different nations and ethnics and languages. And we thank you for exampling that here in Acts 10 and 11 through Peter and Cornelius. And God, for us, I ask that you will help work in us so that we would know what you are doing, what you want to do in us and through us regarding valuing every person. God, that we would be more like Jesus and we would trust Jesus. And Holy Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit to work in us, that we would love others as you love them and to actively pursue unity with those who are especially different than us, but share in the same Savior, Jesus. 
We ask for your help, that you would bless Valley Brook in this. You'd bless the churches in our Chippewa Valley in this. And that you would bless, um, you, you would bless your kingdom. That heaven would become more crowded as an example of you working in this area. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child. Free at last, he has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, he's free. want to hear from you, would you please take 30 seconds uh, today before you run off and do something else, go to valleybrookchurch.org slash connect, fill out a connect form. 30 seconds, that's all it takes. We want to hear from you, how we can be praying for you. If you, got, you could even just say hi to us. We'd love to hear that. Uh, if you have a desire to be baptized or if there's some question that we can help you, we are here to help serve you during this time. So take 30 seconds, fill out that connect form. And also, uh, since we are a, a give first uh, people, because God is a give first God. Uh, we want to just say thank you for those of you who are financially helping to give to the church. Um, thank you for your generosity in doing so. If you'd like to give today, uh, you can do that at valleybrookchurch.org slash give, or you can mail a check to, uh, to our offices. And again, I just want to say thank you for your generosity in helping the mission of the church continue to go forth so that more people might meet, know, and follow Jesus. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you again next week. God bless and keep looking up.